The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Cone Resnick, forward-thinking advice to navigate business and financial issues. Visit ConeResnick.com. By BB&T, banking, business, and commercial real estate loans. Visit BB&T.com. And Bull Realty, when your business requires proven performance, visit BullRealty.com. And by France Media, providing exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit FranceMediaInc.com. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Show. Thank you for joining us to lead, learn, and laugh. Learn market knowledge and best practices to lead your company's success and laugh. I think we have to have some fun along the way. Well, hello, I'm Michael Bull, your host to the world of commercial real estate. Well, today we're going to explore the important world of commercial real estate contracts. You know, if you buy or sell property or you advise those who do, you know how crucial the sales agreement can become. It's a legal document, and it secures the rights and obligations of the parties. For a buyer who has a property under contract, it can become so valuable it's sometimes referred to as equitable title. For a seller, I think understanding contracts is even more important because sellers rarely have any rights to cancel a contract after they've signed it. While attorneys should be the ones who write contracts, everyone should have a thorough understanding of contracts. Especially when you think about this, when the buyer, the seller, and the brokers are typically closer to the property details and the market factors and the interests of the parties that they're working with. Now, on this show, we will only touch briefly on some of the aspects of commercial contracts. So keep in mind, your local real estate attorney should be consulted in any contractual matters. An attorney familiar with your goals, the property, and your local laws and customs. Nothing we say today is intended as specific legal advice. Well, please welcome my guest, Seth Wiseman, partner with Wiseman, Nowak, Curry, and Wilco, a respected law firm with offices throughout Florida and Georgia. Seth represents developers, builders, lenders, corporate and institutional property owners, and real estate brokers with respect to their real estate and legal needs. Seth is also general counsel for the Georgia Association of Realtors. Seth also authored the Red Book on Real Estate Contracts, which is available on Amazon. Seth, welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Show. Well, thank you, Michael. Great to be here. Thank you. And to get us started, uh, Seth, can you share with us what should the goals be of a well-written commercial sales contract? Well, obviously what you're trying to do with the contract mm-hmm. is to, first of all, set out the business deal of the parties. So you want to make sure you understand the deal completely so you can put it down in writing. You want to make sure, frankly, that what you are creating is an enforceable contract because too often people draft contracts on their own and they may not make the contract legally enforceable because of of, of provisions they put into it. Right, which is fine if everybody's hunky-dory goes down the road, but if there's a conflict, then it becomes real important, right? Absolutely. That's why real estate contracts have to be in writing, and um, you're correct. It, it, it has to be able to withstand the, the test of there being a dispute between the parties. Yeah, I think your point's well taken there because sometimes I'll see contracts and you read them, and it's hard to really understand the intent of the parties. And that contract on its own you should be able to read that and know the full intent of, of all the parties involved, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And what about things that aren't in writing, Seth? I mean, sometimes a seller will tell you, you know, we'll take care of it, we'll do this, it doesn't need to be in the contract. What do you think about that? Everything needs to be in the contract because mm-hmm. as a general rule, if it's not in the contract, you are not going to be able to argue about it later in court. And basically what our courts do when there's a real estate dispute is they look only at the four corners of the contract. No one is going to be asking, well, what was your verbal discussion? Right. If it's not in the contract, it doesn't count. Okay. And so what questions do you ask clients before you start to prepare that contract for them? Well, you know, I do it a little differently than some lawyers do. Some lawyers try to have a one-size-fits-all approach to real estate contracts, and you really have to understand the deal and really who has leverage in the deal 
and come up with a contract that works for that given situation. You know, for example, if your client is buying a distressed apartment complex from a bank, you're not going to likely get a contract that gives you much protection. But it's okay if you've got the best business deal in the world. So what you're always really looking for is to understand the business deal so that you can come up with a contract that reflects that deal. Yeah, that's a very good point because you don't want to lose a deal because you couldn't get something the the bank to agree something in the contract and you just lost a great, incredible buy. Right. And, you know, the contract should be the tail that wags the dog Mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, you know, you, you need to understand what level of risk your client is willing to take. If the client says to you, this is a great deal, I don't want to lose it, you need to be more flexible in the purchase and sale contract than you might otherwise be. If the client says to you conversely, I'm paying top dollar for this property and I want to be absolutely protected, you draft a different type of purchase and sale contract. Right. That's- but, yeah, but at the end of the day, the lawyer's job is to identify risks to the client. The client then decides which risks they want to take and not take. Right. And that's a good point. And you talked about the market factors affecting the contractual language and what you should expect to get. And I think that's another good reason for all the parties involved, the, uh, let's say the buyer, uh, the attorney, uh, and their counsel uh, to work together on those contracts because the buyer and the, in this example, and the broker may be closer to the property. They may have seen the property. The attorney may have not. The, the broker may be very aware of the market factors and, and should be also involved with that. Another uh, risk uh, that we've seen is, in a situation we've seen, is that uh, buyers are, are signing a contract, uh, maybe it's uh, personally, because they're going to do a, a single asset entity, but they haven't formed it yet. Uh, what are the risks of a buyer signing a contract personally and then later assigning it uh, prior to closing? Well, if you enter into a contract in the name of, mm-hmm. let's say, a single purpose legal entity that's not yet been created, whoever signs that contract is going to have personal liability on that contract. Because the entity's not there yet, right? Right. Right. And at least what the law is in most states is that if you're signing in the name of a fictitious entity, again, personal liability. So most contracts, the seller keeps the earnest money if the buyer defaults. But there are other contracts where the seller can sue for damages and the buyer could be putting himself or herself at significant risk. And they don't want to do that. Right. And that's another situation we we probably should talk about. I think as a purchaser, you want to understand, and a seller, if the purchaser does default, uh, what are his risks there? Does he have full liquidated damages to just lose his earnest money? Or in some cases, uh, if he doesn't have that in the contract, the seller could possibly even sue him for not performing, right? Uh, he could, or but at least my own philosophy in trying to draft a contract is if things don't work out, I try to do everything I can where the parties contemplate that and aren't suing each other after the fact. Good point, yeah. But, but where there are instead prescribed remedies. For the seller, that typically means... I keep the earnest money. So you want to make sure the earnest money is in a sufficient amount where the seller is compensated for for their for his or her time. On the buyer side, the key remedy you want to make sure you have is specific performance. If you breach the contract, I want to be able to sue you so that I can get the benefit of my bargain. I want to get the property that I contracted to buy. Right. I mean, if you don't have that, uh, if the seller can just breach the contract and you get your earnest money back, you don't have much of a contract, do you? No, but you would be amazed, particularly on the distressed deals, Mm -hmm. how many sellers write contracts where they say, if I breach, you get your earnest money back in $100. Yeah. (laughs) That, to me, is an invitation for the seller to continue to shop the deal because if they get a much better offer, all they do is they give you back your money and the $100, 
it's not much of an incentive for them to stay in the deal. Yeah, we see that all the time in the contracts. We haven't really seen it happen where seller actually does that, uh, but the buyer certainly has a risk uh, if the seller could just cancel the contract and, and see ya, say, see you later. All right, we're going to have to take a break. When we get back, we're going to talk about some more issues, including do you have to have earnest money uh, to make a contract legal and some other issues to help you with commercial real estate contracts. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Cone Resnick, forward-thinking advice to navigate business and financial issues. Visit ConeResnick.com. By BB&T, banking, business, and commercial real estate loans. Visit BB&T.com. And Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit BullRealty.com. And by France Media, providing exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit FranceMediaInc.com. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. If you have any questions or comments related to this show or any commercial real estate related endeavors, we enjoy hearing from you. You're invited to give us a call at 888 612 show. You can also email us at info at com, or you can reach us through your favorite social media site. You can find them all at commercialrealestateshow.com. Today, we're exploring commercial real estate contracts with Seth Wiseman, with Wiseman, Nowak, Curry, and Wilco. And Seth, we're talking before the break uh, about earnest money. And I think some people have the misconception that you have to have earnest money to make a contract enforceable. Do you? No, in most jurisdictions, the answer to that is absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It's the mutual promises in the contract, they are always thought of as sufficient consideration for the contract. So no, you do not have to have earnest money. Okay. And what about the amount of earnest money? What are some guidelines for a proper amount of earnest money in a commercial sales contract? Well, I think it depends on whether you're working with the buyer or the seller. <laughs> yeah. If you're the seller, you want it to be as large an amount as possible so that if the buyer defaults, it you have compensation for the for the property being off the market for what could be months at a time. Right. Um, if you're a buyer, you typically don't want to put up much earnest money unless you're trying to make a statement that, hey, I'm for real, right? and we have an, a, a capacity to get the deal done. And if you're trying to make that statement, there's no better way than to show that you are willing to put up a lot of upfront money. Yeah, I, that's a good point. And when I was 24, I'd been in commercial real estate for um, five years. So I, of course, knew everything. And uh, I was writing a, a talking about a contract with a, a lady that was buying a property. It was $3 million. And uh, she, I said, well, how much earnest money do you want to put down? And she said, oh, $500,000. And I went, oh, that, that's way too much. I mean, you don't need to put down that much earnest money. And she said, oh, no, uh, 500000 is fine. And I started to say again, you know, because I was so experienced that, uh, no, that, that's too much money. She said, listen here, Sonny, <laughs> it's going to be $500,000. And not only that, when you present the contract, you're going to take my check there, and you're going to turn it around, and you're going to slide it across and put it in front of the seller so that that seller knows I'm serious because that money's safe. It's going to be an escrow. I'm not worried about that. I want to make a statement that I'm their best buyer. Right. And it's a powerful statement you make when you can write a check for that amount. And frankly, we're in a market increasingly where there's competition for properties. Right. And when you have competition, no better way to show that you're for real than to put up a lot of money. Yeah. We were talking earlier, we just closed a 865 acre land deal and we're representing the seller and we're trying to find out that this potential buyer was real and he had the money and you know, should we go under contract? And they wanted to be pretty quiet about who the buyer was because he's a, a famous person. And uh, so they didn't want to tell us that. So finally they said, all right, you're, we're paying $5.6 million. Here's $5 million in escrow. <laughs> so we said, okay, yeah, we're fine with that. You know? Well, you know, interestingly, earnest money does not always have to be money. I worked on a transaction once where a famous artist 
used one of his million dollar paintings as earnest money and the seller thought about it but at the end of the day he said I'll take this because he knew he could turn it into significant cash yeah that's great I was uh, selling a building to uh, uh, a famous person uh, once and when I asked for earnest money he said look my word Mr. Bull is my earnest money of course I was about 22 so you know you're in trouble when they call you Mr. when you're 22 right and I said well my seller's an attorney and he's going to want more than word he's going to want to see money so it does show earnest and, and it's important but you also have to have enough earnest money I think for it to be enough to be argued over I mean if, if you're buying a $3 million building and you put a $5,000 earnest money, first of all, the seller may think you're not serious. But beyond that, if there's an argument over the money uh, and you and you go to attorneys, I mean... The, yeah, your attorney's fees are going to be more than what the, you're, the amount yeah, you're fighting over. And yeah. that never makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what are the risks for the seller if the entity that remits the earnest money check does not match the entity that signs the contract. So if I sign a contract as Michael Bull Buyer and then I provide earnest money from Bull Realty Inc., uh, what could that mean for the seller or, or maybe the listing agent? Well, really, you want to make sure that if the person who's putting up earnest money is not the buyer, it raises one red flag as to, well, why doesn't the buyer have any money? <laughs> right. But the other thing it does is... I, I don't have any money. That's why I did it. Right. <laughs> no. Um you know, you just want to make sure that when that stranger to the contract is putting up money, that there's a written agreement where that stranger understands that his or her money is at risk. And if you don't have a written agreement where the stranger putting up the earnest money is acknowledging that, they may be able to get their earnest money back even in the event of a dispute. Yeah. And you want to avoid that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And you know, we watch out for that because in that case, if Michael Bull defaulted on that contract and the seller was due the money, uh, Bull Realty Inc. might step in and say, look, uh, guys, you didn't have an agreement to hold our money at Bull Realty Inc. And we want that money back. Right. Absolutely. Well, what if a contract is silent on the issue of delayed earnest money, Seth, uh, not being remitted? You know, so the, the buyer says, All right, I'm going to remit you know, $50,000 in three days. Then the buyer doesn't remit it. It's silent on the remedy there. Uh, could the seller still be under contract and bound by that contract, even though the earnest money wasn't delivered? Well, it, it depends on how the contract is written. Mm -hmm. If the contract says, I will remit earnest money in three days, and the buyer doesn't, the buyer is in technical breach of the contract and the seller could terminate the contract. So he's got to go, the seller would have to go, his default remedies, look at what the contract costs for purchase or default and what notices the seller has to give, right? Yeah, and typically for the failure to timely deposit earnest money, mm -hmm. most contracts will give the buyer an opportunity to cure that default. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, the seller can just say, too bad, so sad, we're moving on to another buyer and we're terminating. And if they do terminate, they then arguably, because the buyer is breached, try to keep the earnest money. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's there, right? Right. And you talked about notification in these situations. How important is the notice section of a commercial real estate contract? Well, it's the most important section in the world to check once things start going south in a transaction. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in real estate contracts, you've got to comply with the notice section. And we see so many disputes where notice is given verbally instead of in writing, or notice may have to be sent to two or three different parties, including the party and his lawyer or her lawyer. And if it's not done just the right way, your notice may be ineffective. And that is really critical where things occur on a calendar where if you've got a 30-day due diligence period and I send a notice to terminate on day 30 and I don't do it the right way, 
I may end up buying a piece of property that I didn't intend to buy. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And we see that a lot where the notice is required to be in writing or overnight delivery. And the buyer just calls and sends an email. And that's not really notice. And I think uh, someone needs to tell that purchaser, no, you've got to give notice within the time of period as per the notice provision. And I like your point. If you're supposed to copy someone, you better copy someone. Well, stay with us. We'll have more on commercial real estate contracts in just a moment. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Cone Resnick forward-thinking advice to navigate business and financial issues. Visit ConeResnick.com. By bb and banking, business, and commercial real estate loans. Visit bb and And Bull Realty, when your business requires proven performance, visit BullRealty.com. And by France Media, providing exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit FranceMediaInc.com. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. You know, you may be listening to the show today anywhere from Orlando to Sacramento. The show has been broadcast around the world for two and a half years now on iTunes and the show website, Commercial Real Estate Show. And the show is aired on 10 radio stations across the U.S. We'd like to welcome listeners in Seattle on Money Radio 1300 KKOL. Well, today we're exploring commercial real estate contract with Seth Wiseman with Wiseman, Nowak, Curry, and Wilco. And uh, Seth, I'd like to ask you about the types of deeds and how important is that to be spelled out in the contract, say, uh, for example, a general deed uh, versus a limited uh, warranty deed? Well, obviously, if you're the buyer, you'd like to get a general warranty deed. In most commercial real estate transactions, Typically, you're seeing people using more limited warranties where they may be warranting title for the period that they own the property. But at the end of the day, what the most important thing is for buyers is to know that they can get a title, an owner's title insurance policy that is protecting them in the event of a title defect being discovered down the road. Okay. Well, that's a good point. And also, we've seen occasionally a uh, purchaser decide uh, not to get uh, title insurance. Uh, how important is that? I would never buy a piece of property without getting title insurance. And it's critically important that you get an owner's policy in addition for their, in addition, the lender is always going to require a lender's policy. But there, you know, we live in a world where there are title problems that arise, but most importantly, we see situations sometimes where there's fraud. You know, I worked on a transaction once in the residential context where um, people owned a vacation home. They went back to their home state. Someone broke into the house, assumed their identity, and sold the property. The couple comes back the next summer and someone is now living in their house. Wow. Title insurance protected all of the parties in that transaction. So I, I would never buy a piece of property without an owner's title policy. That's a good point. And now you're making me think about that. I think when I go home tonight, I'll knock on the door first, <laughs> make sure no one's there, right? Well, um, what about allocations for tax purposes. How important it is, is it for a buyer or a seller to have the allocations in the sales contract of, you know, what's personal property, what's business property, what's land, what's improvements? I think it depends on the type of real estate transaction you're involved with. You Typically, it is not an issue where the value of the personal property is small you see in those kinds of deals, frankly, it typically not being addressed. But if you're selling an operating business along with real estate, having everybody agree on the value of the personality versus the value of the dirt um, avoids disputes down the road. Right. Okay. Well, that's a good point. So you're not typically seeing it in a, in a normal sales contract on a, on a smaller 2 to $3 million property. Then. No. Yeah. Okay. And what is the best practice for a buyer uh, if the legal drawn on the purchaser's new survey 
is different than the legal in the contract and, and the warranty deed. You know, should the buyer ask the seller to sign a quick claim deed you know, based on the new legal? Uh, we always ask for that mm -hmm. so that you, you basically would have the seller signing two deeds, mm -hmm. a warranty deed on the property that everyone acknowledges they own, and then a quit claim deed on anything that is shown by the survey to also be owned by that party. And at least in the commercial purchase and sale contracts we draft, we include that as a standard provision. Okay. I think that's very important. And sometimes I see people missing out on that where the the meets and bounds description is a little bit different on the new survey and they're not quit claiming that from the seller. And in some cases they could be mis missing a a sliver of the property or something that could be important down the road. Yeah, well, it's particularly important if you've got an aggregation of property where you're putting multiple pieces together because what you don't want to end up with is a gore or sliver that you now don't have title to. Yeah, that can be uh, very crucial. Well, we're going to have to take a, a quick break here, but when we get back, we're going to talk about tenant estoppels. And you know, one of the things that, that we've seen there is we'll see a lot of contracts and commercial contracts where the seller has to provide tenant estoppel letters, and uh, it's a requirement. So if the seller doesn't do it, the buyer could, could sue them, uh, but uh, the seller doesn't have any control over that. So we're going to talk about that and see what are some best practices there. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Cohn Resnick, forward-thinking advice to navigate business and financial issues. Visit KohnResnick.com. By BB&T, banking, business, and commercial real estate loans. Visit BB&T.com. And Bull Realty, when your business requires proven performance, visit BullRealty.com. And by France Media, providing exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit FranceMediaInc.com. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. If you'd like to know the absolute latest on any commercial real estate related topics, check out our on demand show podcast. For example, last week we did a show on commercial real estate auctions. And be sure to check out a show on how tax changes of 2013 may affect the commercial real estate industry. We also did a great show on the single tenant net lease investment market. You can access these shows anytime on your smartphone or computer. Just visit iTunes or the show website, commercialrealestateshow.com. Well, today we're exploring commercial real estate contracts with Seth Wiseman with Wiseman, Nowak, Curry, and Wilco. And Seth, before the break, we, we started talking about tenant estoppel uh, letters. And a lot of times we're seeing that uh, commercial contracts are written and uh, a seller we're representing is asked to promise, to guarantee in the contract that its tenants are going to sign tenant estoppel letters satisfactory uh, to the purchaser and their lender. And in some cases, you get a tenant that uh, maybe the lease doesn't require them to do a tenant estoppel, or they just don't get around to it or don't want to do it, or they don't agree to something that uh, that they should. Uh, what do you think about that? Should tenant estoppels be a requirement and guaranteed by the seller, or should they, if you represent the seller, be a contingency that if the tenant doesn't do it, all right, the buyer can buy the property or not, but he can't sue the seller? Yeah, well, really what you're, I, I would prefer that um, it be a contingency mm -hmm. on the part of the seller rather than a requirement. And the great point that you're making is that some things are beyond the control of the seller. Mm -hmm. The contract may say in words, the tenant shall provide an estoppel certificate, but some tenants don't. And if they don't, as a seller, you don't want to be financially at risk for, for something you may not be able to control. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and we see people expecting that a lot from our seller clients. And I, I just don't like that situation. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do endeavor to do everything we can. In fact, if you, sometimes we'll, we'll agree to get them 
up front while they're still in due diligence period and get them as soon as we can. Uh, but uh, if the tenant doesn't do it, you know, we can't make them. Right. Actually, it's the same point really on title defects. Mm -hmm. There are some title defects that the seller may not be aware exists. Mm -hmm. And if the seller's affirmatively required to fix everything, seller can end up being stuck. That's what you want to avoid. What about when you see in a sales contract that in that case, the purchaser has a right to if it's if it can be fixed monetarily let's say for a hundred thousand dollars that title defect can be fixed and the purchaser has an automatic right to to, to to pay that at closing to deduct it from the proceeds what do you think about that when you're repping the seller well I, I happen to think that things that can be cured by the payment of money that the seller should know what those things are and I, Certainly, I don't think it is unreasonable for the buyer to expect the seller to pay off liens and encumbrances. But if the seller says, gosh, I don't know if there are liens on my property, it's very easy to find out. You do a quick title search. Yeah, but typically the, the seller's not doing that title search in advance. And, you know, that's a good point. You said, you know, if the seller might not know that somebody put a lien on his property, uh, it's possible. I mean, you know, does he really know? Like, you know, okay. Well, well it, it's really, you know, typically in a contract, the buyer's the one doing due diligence. Mm -hmm. But when a seller goes to sell property, sometimes the seller needs to do some due diligence as well. And in and the title area is one where the seller may want to do some due diligence. Especially in this market. Right. <laughs> Amen. Well, how important are seller reps and warranties, uh, Seth, and their survival of the contract to, to a buyer or a seller? Well, they're very important from a buyer's perspective. And the reason that they are so important is in a commercial real estate transaction, the seller is not affirmatively required, typically in most jurisdictions, to disclose hidden or latent defects. So what you often will want to do is have the seller make some reps or warranties to verify that they are disclosing things they may be aware of. The other issue is from a due diligence perspective, if I am going to be spending 50 or 100 or $200,000 as a buyer, doing due diligence, I don't want to be spending that kind of money only to then learn that there was an environmental problem that the seller knew about. So what you're really trying to do with reps and warranties is to get information up front so that you can make a smart business decision about the property. And from a survival perspective, you really want them typically to survive for a reasonable period after closing so that if you learn that the seller was uh, fibbing about something, you have some recourse. Right. And then as a seller, uh, you, you want the opposite, right? You want them to look at everything and buy it or not. Right. And legitimately, from a seller's perspective, seller wants to take the money. And if they've got partners or investors, they want to distribute the money and not hold money in reserve. So they're not going to want to be on the hook for reps and warranties for years at a time. But is it reasonable to expect reps and warranties to survive for six months or a year? I think the answer is yes. And we're short on the break, but what are you seeing with banks? They typically don't uh, want to do any reps or warranties, right? Well, it's a trade-off. Mm -hmm. Banks are going to typically on their properties give you a great financial deal, but they're not going to rep or warrant anything. Right. And an interesting point you said there with the, the seller disclosing everything so that the, the buyer doesn't spend all that money in due diligence and then the deal fall apart. I think that's one thing that we try to do as a broker is, is find the hair in the deal, find the property, do a lot of due diligence on our own so we can pre-manage that. And there's no, there's no property that can't be sold. Uh, it's just if you know the challenges up front and you work through them. Uh, and you let the purchaser know about them and adjust the price to, uh, to accommodate it. All right, we're going to have to take a, a quick break. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Stay with us. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Cone Resnick. 
forward-thinking advice to navigate business and financial issues. Visit KohnResnick.com. By BB&T, banking, business, and commercial real estate loans. Visit BB&T.com. And Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit BullRealty.com. And by France Media, providing exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit FranceMediaInc.com. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We have some very interesting shows coming up for you, including a show on the retail sector and an update on the hotel industry and an interesting show on apps. That show is going to be called There's an App for That. Be sure to catch shows of special interest to you. Sign up for a once a week email announcing the show topic at commercialrealestateshow.com. Well, today we're exploring commercial real estate contracts with Seth Wiseman. And Seth, I'd like to ask you about uh, rezoning. What's most important to a seller and a buyer in a contract that's contingent on rezoning? Well, from a seller's perspective, I think a lot of sellers don't fully realize that a rezoning may take a few months, but in an extreme case, it could take a few years. So the question for the seller to think about is, am I really willing to let my property be tied up for that long a period of time? Most sellers are going to want the right to pull the plug on the contract if the rezoning doesn't take place within a reasonable period of time. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And what we like to do there is put some sort of drop dead date on it because the purchaser wants the rights to extend it and extend it if they need to and it makes sense. But the seller needs some kind of uh, date that, look, if you don't get this done, this contract ends. Right. And, you know, if you think about it from the buyer side, if I can take three years rezoning it, I really am getting three years of potential appreciation without mm-hmm. having to pay for it. Right, especially if you don't have your uh, your permit yet to, to start putting a shovel in the ground, you may want to delay it so you don't have the interest carry. Right. Well, what about uh, buyers on a, on a contract contingent on rezoning? They also need the contract to require the seller to sign the paperwork uh, for the rezoning, right? Because the, the only the owner of the property can rezone it, right? Yes. Typically, a contract is going to say that the seller will fully cooperate with the buyer and the seller authorizes the buyer to act as the seller's rep in going ahead and getting the rezoning. Okay. And if you're a buyer in that situation, too, you want to make sure you've got a contingency beyond the zoning, right? Because you could have a period of in some, some jurisdictions, after the zoning is approved, that someone could appeal it, right? Yeah, the appeal period in most states is 30 days. Mm-hmm. And so you would want to define final rezoning as the date it's approved plus the appeal period. So you're not forced to buy property where some neighbor is then suing to challenge the the uh, zoning approval. Yeah, that's a very good point. We've seen some contracts say we'll close within 15 uh, days of just final zoning approval, and you may need to find that better. Well, Seth, uh, as as this become a tradition on the show, can you share a quick closing tip for our listeners? Well, I would share two. The first would be hire a realtor because <laughs> they tend to be more sophisticated and have greater expertise, I think, than non-realtors. Mm-hmm. The second tip would be, and this may sound funny coming from a lawyer, but um, there are limits to what a contract can do. A contract will not make an unreasonable person reasonable. And I think buyers and sellers sometimes don't focus enough on the type of person they are dealing with. And there are some buyers and some sellers that are so difficult it simply makes sense on the front end not to work with them at all. Yeah, that's a very good point. And in our shop, we call those red flags. And when you see those red flags, you better beware. You may have to do more due diligence. Uh, You may want to back away, but you certainly need to take care of yourself when you see the flags. Yes, be careful. All right. Well, Seth, thanks for joining us today. We sure appreciate your insight. Oh, glad glad to be here. Hope I can do it again in the future. Thank you. And for more information from Seth Wiseman, visit WNCWLaw.com. Well, I have an invitation for you as a listener. Can you join us next week? Well, I hope so. We'll be discussing the hospitality industry. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Michael Bull. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for the Commercial Real Estate Show.
The Commercial Real Estate Show is made available by professionals at Cohn Resnick, bb and France Media, and Bull Realty. For more information about these companies or to access additional show podcasts or videos, visit commercialrealestateshow.com.